Welcome back to another episode of Acceptable Chess Weekly Roundup and the first weekly roundup for the Autumn Classic. Once again, I am your host, John Harden, here with esteemed national master, Andrew Hoy, live and in person. Very exciting times. Um, we have been looking forward to doing this show. We're very much happy to be back with you. And we've got a lot of games, as usual, to get through. So, uh, Andrew, what did you notice in terms of trends. I guess it's too early to talk about the standings, but uh, what what are some things that we noticed from the games this week? Yeah, so I think there were a lot of tactical opportunities, both uh, things that were missed and things that people took advantage of. So going forward, we want to make sure that everybody's really focusing on these tactical opportunities and making the most of these tactical shots. Uh, so to that end, kind of everything is somewhat related to that. Make sure that when you're developing, uh, develop all of your pieces to control the center. And I'm sure as time goes on, we'll talk more about development and developing with a plan. But first and foremost, try and make a claim to the center right out of the gate. I think there were a lot of games where people uh, kind of stayed to the fringes and it came back to bite them in the rear ends later in the game. Yeah. Uh, similarly, I think it's important not to trade pieces unless you have a really good reason to trade the pieces. Uh, that's not to say that every trade is bad, but make sure that the trades that you are making are justifiable and that there's a reason to trade the pieces when you do. Don't just trade because you can. Yeah, absolutely. It reduces the level of complexity, which means, sure, you may feel safer, but it also takes an opportunity out of your opponent's hands to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And the last thing that we want everybody to do is stay alert. Uh, there are a lot of times when somebody just missed something that came up or um, blundered a trick because they weren't paying enough attention to what their uh, opponent can do. So those are um, topics and trends for tonight. Very, very good. Okay, well, let's jump right into things, and we're going to look at our first game of the evening, which actually I think was also the first game played. I think you're right. Absolutely. So this was uh, Lydia versus Chip, and I actually wanted to lead off with this game because I thought that it a little bit defied description, because I think that Lydia actually in this game played well and did a lot of the things that we're talking about. So if we just cruise through the opening here a little mm -hmm. bit, we'll see um, we went into an open Sicilian um, and Chip adopted a Nidorf defense. That's that early A6 move that you're seeing. And Lydia develops her pieces in a very typical way. She plays a little bit of an unusual attack here. This Queen F3 idea, I'm a big fan, and I think you are too, mm -hmm. Andrew, right, of the pawns coming out first. And can yes. you talk a little bit about why that is? Yeah, so here we like to um, push the pawns forward and try and make more of a claim in the center. Uh, this is one of the sharpest openings in all of chess, so there's a lot of tactical justification. White is almost always playing for one of these e5 or f5 moves. Concretely, this goes bishop e7, queen f3, and then queen c7. And both sides have excellent attacking chances. Uh, black is attacking on the queen side. Black sometimes castles queen side here uh, because white's pawns are very far advanced and it's a little bit scary to castle king side when uh, the f and g pawns are already in your face. Yeah, so I like this a lot better, and you'll see me talk about this a lot, that I really love a true checkmating attack usually has the pawns going first. Mm -hmm. um, so this does work, and it's been played by a number of grandmasters, and so you might sort of get the idea that it's perfectly good, but we still think it's a lot easier to play when you push that f-pawn first. Anyway, yeah. so that's a small adjustment. But the rest of it was very accurately played, I think, mm -hmm. and, and Lydia had some good chances. Um, this bishop seam four move turns out to be a mistake. The bishop's a little vulnerable. Yeah, it, it, again, this is um, more concrete stuff. A knight e5 is a nice trick here to fork the queen and the bishop. And if black can grab one of the bishops in this position, it's almost always going to pay off. Yeah, so that was a little bit of a missed shot by Chip, but maybe Chip had a psychic sense that we uh, are not aware of because unfortunately, although Lydia played very well, and I want to make sure that that is the emphasis here, um, she did make, a, I think, a vision mistake mm -hmm. here. She decided that uh, Black was only able to take on a6 with the pawn, which would very conveniently hang the a8 rook and be a very nice tactic. Unfortunately, ah, yes, and knight c6 also yep. very strong. Yeah, there. very good squares. But unfortunately, rook takes is the best move, mm -hmm. which Chip did play. And now she's basically just down a piece for a pawn, which is. And it's even worse than that because now the A file is open, which is something that Black works really hard to do, anyways, in this opening. Absolutely. So uh, her position pretty well collapsed after that. Mm -hmm. I think the only other detail that I wanted to mention here so if we just click forward a few more moves, um, Chip did have something a little bit earlier. 
Uh, yeah, a few more. Rook B6, right? Yeah, yeah some very nice moves out mm -hmm. of Chip here, developing the queenside attack. And then right here, um, I think, or even another turn later. <laughs> forgive me. I'm first time without my controls. Right here. Back up. I'm the worst. Okay. Okay. Right here, um, Bishop C3 check is a really nice move that completely uh, blocks the queen's ability to come to the king's defense and would lead to a decisive win of material. We can see that basically the king just has to run for it because, of course, coming to uh, coming to a2 is going to lead to some very fast checkmates mm -hmm. after rook b2 check and queen a3. Um, so the king just makes a run for it, and I think probably we can check here first, king moves, and then pick up at least a piece here, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not going well. So that was just a chance for Chip to finish things off earlier, but otherwise I thought he collected the point very nicely. Yeah, it was a nice game, um, and other than bishop a6, I thought it was a nice game by both colors. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what Lydia can do when she recovers in round two. Yes. So, moving on. This game, I think, is an excellent opening choice for the player involved, but I will say that he needs to work out the theory. So, Dave, uh, in his first sally against our champion from last summer's tur tournament, Aaron, um, he decided to go with the Mora Gambit. Now, the idea here, of course, is to give up a pawn in order to get very fast development for your pieces and the open C and D files for your rooks, eventually. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of key that you know that knight takes c3 is kind of the little, little engine that makes all this work. So right off the bat, after pawn takes, Dave is behind in development, and now he's just kind of given up a pawn. Yeah, and it's taking squares away from the knight, so... I want my B-pawn back. Yeah. You are yourself a, a very well-accomplished practitioner of this gambit. I do like it a lot. I think it's a lot of fun, and it's a good way to avoid some of the sharpest Sicilian theory. Absolutely. So, uh, <laughs> there's that word again. Yeah. <laughs> now Aaron defended very well. He um, develops nicely, um, if I scroll the right way. Uh, here, this is a common trick um, in the Mora Gambit that white has E5. If we go back a little bit and make our moves again. E5 would be strong here uh, because we have ideas of queen takes and we can attack F7. The most accurate way to play this is to actually play bishop c4 first and now knight c6 is basically losing already. Um, and one amusing line can be black losing the entire queen after bishop takes F7 check. It is one of my favorites. Yes, and white would happily take an extra queen in this position. Yeah. Uh, so e5 is at least grounded in uh, some good motifs. Unfortunately here, uh, black traded the queens, black is up uh, this structural edge that's going to last forever, and black went on to collect a full point. Yeah, uh, we, we thought uh, for the parties involved this was enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Dave make use of that gambit, because I think he loves to attack, and it's a good choice for him. Yes, and Dave, don't trade the queens in the Mora gambit. Absolutely. All right, uh, let's look at the next game, and this one was off to a pretty good start. Although this is one of the games that we wanted to talk about controlling the center. So, so far Black's made three moves and none of them are advancing to the fifth rank. So I would have liked to see D5 here instead of G6 just to stake a claim to the center. The knight on C6 is a little bit funny, but this is a um, well-known pattern. The knight on C6 can recover later. And I bet if we look, we'll see that this has been played a lot. So this has been played... Um, looks like 60 times in grandmaster practice so it's um, not the worst way to play in the world after g6 i think we're giving white a very large center white's going to get e4 in right away so here he played e4 and now i think additionally white could go further and play e5 and just banish this knight back to g8 and i think this would have been a really nice way to uh kind of collect the full point right out of the opening uh the dark squares are tragically weak the knight can come to e4 and f6 and i don't really see how black can survive this uh opening here uh white did let black off the hook a little bit white played some uh, normal looking moves black continued to kind of avoid the center and uh eventually white did uh take over some of the center we see that black still hasn't put anything in the center and it's just waiting too long and sooner or later white is forced to play a good move and white finally played e5 yeah absolutely yeah charlie i would say who was playing white here mm -hmm. built a really impressive position and i would just coach him to once you have that impressive position position recognize 
that although it's very aesthetically pleasing, you do have to venture out and eventually try to crush the guy. Um, but he does. And the other thing I think that's tactically interesting here, because we saw it a couple mm -hmm. of times, is I don't know if Dave saw this idea and just was desperate, but it's very, very important when you have mutually attacking um, pawns to recognize, actually here, uh, Dave is only getting a pawn, but that that e-pawn of Charlie's is going to be able to take three times and the last time with check. And so that is not a battle of desperado that you want to get involved in. Not at all. I, th I like to think of this as checkers because we're capturing on these diagonals and we just keep on taking. Absolutely. It, we're um, playing chess. Don't play checkers unless yeah. you're playing checkers on your opponents hanging all his pieces. All right. Uh, so here now whites up an entire piece. Uh, White continued to play very good moves. I like knight e4 a lot, and I think that this is kind of a, a decisive advantage for White at this point. Yeah, he, he uh, converted nicely. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't see anything clicking through. Oh, can we go to the end? Sure. There was, so it took, Charlie found it the second time around, but it is a very pretty checkmate, actually, with two knights and a bishop uh, instead. Even though the queens are still on the board, uh, the minor pieces become the star of the show here. And Charlie finds a very similar idea to this, but right here, after King h8, there is the very nice bishop g7, which ends the game in very beautiful fashion. Mm -hmm. And the uh, key point is that we can never take this knight. There's always going to be a mate on g7. Uh, yes, and both players saw that, which yes. kudos to them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, moving right along. Yes, and, and picking up off of an earlier point. So this, this game, I thought... Despite a very strange opening from Tyler, I think he forgot his preparation by his own admission, but uh, we did see some pretty good central play out of both players, and after a little tactical shuffling, Black was able to come up with a piece. And so one of the things that I thought was interesting about this game is that it actually breaks some of our idea about not making trades. I think here, when we talk about without a good reason, well, one very good reason to make trades is when you are up material. And as Black is up a full piece, Andrew, what should Black play here? Yeah, I like trading the queens here. I think that the Black King is a little bit weak on the light squares, and getting rid of the queen ends all sorts of attacks. And now Black can focus on slowing down these pawns. I like bishop d6 immediately. Uh, bishop takes f3 would also be fine. I think both of those moves would uh, leave Black with the upper hand and not much work left to do in order to close out the game. Yeah, uh, yes, that is, uh, I think, would give Black a very nice opportunity there. Yeah, you do have to watch out a little bit for those runners mm -hmm. on uh, C6 and, and D5. But otherwise, I have to think that Black is for choice. Yeah, so long as we can keep this dark square blockade, uh, we should be fine. Right. Uh, moving right along, we have, yes, we have uh, a battle of the Stoltzfus host family. We have a large number of this family's contingent playing in our tournament, and I could not be happier about it. Um, but this would be another example of a little bit of uh, simplification disease, maybe mm -hmm. is a term I'll try to coin. Um, I think that Bill makes some very sensible opening moves. We see here a beautiful open Sicilian center, very classic. Um, Black's setup it looks a little bit maybe to play both e6 and g6. Is there something a little strange it's about this? It's trying to be some sort of a hedgehog structure, but I think it's probably a little bit optimistic to play that against uh, the bishop on c4. Uh, an idea like f4 and f5 is going to be extremely strong, and I don't see why we can't do that almost immediately. Maybe tuck the king over on h1 and then... Uh, play f4. Yes, that makes a lot of sense to get off of that diagonal. Mm -hmm. I know queen b6 could maybe be annoying, but I suppose we have bishop e3. We probably have to do something like this so that mm. we don't run into knight g4, and it's right. a little annoying. Uh, so right. I would not recommend going for this as white. I'd recommend putting the king on h1 yeah. and not getting a losing position. But I, I've made that mistake myself a couple of times. So. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I'm going to try not to say absolutely for the rest of the show, but I'm not sure I'll be able to do it. Um, yes, the only thing I wanted to say was that would be a really good example of something that if you had seen a couple of Grandmaster mm -hmm. games and learned some of the basic patterns, I think you could execute it very well. But I can certainly understand why Bill would not be playing F4, F5 uh, right out of the gate, because it looks, I think, scary when you're just trying to play a gentleman's game. Exactly. So here, white traded on c6. I don't like this move. I think it gives up the very nice 
knight on d4, and it lets black bring yet another defender to the d5 square. In the Sicilian, really all black wants to do is play d5. And if black can't play d5, then, well, maybe e5 is a nice substitute for that. But here, we're letting black play d5 almost immediately. Uh, I have to be happy as the black player. Yeah, I know a lot of players, actually, one of them in this tournament, who are afraid of this capture on c6. And I said, more pawns in the center is not going to be a problem for you. Nope, definitely not. All right, but as it went, um, I think that black played a very good game. It was very clean from here. Uh, we're attacking uh, the b2 pawn, so white has to do something about that. We continue to attack, and now we get to a slightly strange moment. Black hasn't castled yet. Uh, there are still some pieces that are a little bit loose, but we start to notice that there's a lot going on on the dark squares, and white has given up the dark square bishop. So I guess if we go back and say one more thing about this, keep the dark square bishop. There's uh, no reason to trade off the dark square bishop. This goes back to like trading without having a good reason. If anything, I'd play queen d2 to reinforce some of the dark squares. Uh, but now we see that we can take, and really bad things are happening over here. Already I'd consider sacrificing the exchange like this in order to start to bail out. Yeah, I, I think uh, at minimum, if you're not hanging the knight, you're, well, yeah, if you try to guard the knight with queen d2, you went into queen b4, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not looking fun for anybody. And even uh, rookie three seems to hang on, but then you have bishop f4. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and here, once again, we should probably consider sacrificing an exchange to try and bail out into some position where we have some compensation. Yes. Uh, yeah, that might be some, although even there the knight hangs. Ouch. Yeah, and it's not so simple for the knight, though, because there's a lot happening on e6, but it's yeah. that's a practical approach to the game. Absolutely. We, yes. we don't want to get there. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Uh, so the game kind of wrapped up after uh, knight a4, uh, queen d4, we traded on d4. And now I think just the black bishop pair, the black center, it's way more than white can deal with. Uh, these pieces are off sides and we're ready to start pushing the center pawns. We have to get the bishop out of the way so it doesn't hang, but then d5, c5, e5, all of these moves are good. And black ended up winning a very nice game. I agree. Okay. Carrying right. forward, yes. So uh, we had Rufus Bear coming all the way in from Scotland to play his game against the legend from New Orleans, Robert Larimer. Um, I was excited to see this game. I actually helped Robert do some of the prep for this hmm. game and then felt very, very guilty because Rufus did not open with the Mora Gambit as I had expected, and he has ventured on other occasions, but rather the C3 Sicilian Andrew... What is the idea of this maybe to some people odd looking move C3? Yeah, so I jumped to this position because this is the idea. We want to get two pawns in the center and we have traded both C pawns instead of trading our D pawn for black C pawn. So this is uh, kind of everything that white is hoping for from playing the Alapin or C3 Sicilian. A easy way to meet it is to play a quick D5. The idea is that now the queen can hang out on D5 because knight c3 is not possible so this is the approach of finding the drawback to your opponent's move and trying to take advantage of it the c3 pawn blocks the natural development of the knight so we'll take the queen and put it on d5 yes and such an important skill because something i would definitely say especially given how many adult players we have is that even for experienced players such as ourselves Learning all of the theory and keeping it straight is very difficult. And if you can remember the ideas, you can find yourself with a lot more ability to figure things out over the board and still be efficient so that you're not burning up your clock mm -hmm. trying to do it live. Exactly. Um, so right, wrong, or indifferent, um, Rufus got a pretty nice center right out of the opening. Here already, you can start to think about a move like d5. This is kind of hoping for a Benoni type structure where the d5 pawn is very nice. I think this would have been acceptable. Uh, instead, Rufus developed and kept the classical center. I think that's fine. And he played it a move later. I think that including knight f3 and h6 is probably good for white. Uh, but I think it's probably... Don't wait to play a good move like d5. It's probably safe to play it right away. Um, so we had a couple more moves. We traded. I like bishop e2 a lot. Again, trying not to trade the pieces uh, just because. And now here we see another interesting moment. I would consider a move like knight to d4 here, uh, trying to keep all of the pieces on the board so that when I castle, I can try and take advantage of the e-file. 
Um, that was kind of the only constructive criticism I had about this game. I think after Castling, uh, Black can think about taking on F3, and it's a little bit uh, of a dodgy structure after we take everything and play D6. So here, I think that this is kind of the... Uh, the stuff that we would be hoping for with black. We do have to make sure that we don't hang the queen, so we have to play something like queen c5 first, picking up a tempo. But I think that already this has gone very well for white. This is kind of black's last chance to try and fight back and to get something out of the position by unbalancing it. Yes, you know, this reminds me of something you said actually last night off stream, which is your opponent's good pawn moves are your good pawn moves. And it's interesting to note that because Robert was not able to get this d6 move in, Rufus got it in for him. And you can yes. see in just another couple of turns how this really cracks the board in half, as our friend Mark Esserman likes to say. Yeah, a very instructive attacking move. By playing d6, we're cutting off this bishop. And now no matter where the queen goes, it's going to be isolated from some part of the board. If it goes back to d8, it's safe, and we're not going to lose a tempo to rookie one, but the queen will never be able to come back to defend the king side. So moves like queen d4 will be possible to do a couple of things. Uh, rook e1, lifting that rook up to e5. The attacking ideas are pretty much endless already. Yeah, and even more uh, depressing than the state of the queen is the state of that c8 light squared bishop, mm -hmm. which cannot possibly go to d7, and b6 cannot be played because it hangs the rook. So just a, a really rough bid, and... Um, oh, there is one more moment that is worth mentioning, however, in this game. Okay. Which is, towards our point of staying alert, Rufus did, I think, hang a tactic. I have not yet uh, done any real close analysis of this, but if we look just a few moves further, one of the reasons that we so often deploy our dark squared bishop to this a7 g1 diagonal is its operation on the f-pawn. And it may not look like much, but we can see in game after game after game, this one being no exception, mm -hmm. that there are tactical opportunities. And a moment of sleepiness after a really good game by Rufus resulted in 25th move h3, which weakens the g3 square. And here... I'm not, I wasn't totally positive. White still has sort of a brutal kingside attack, mm -hmm. but certainly we can take that bishop on g3, and I think that uh, black has to have something going here. Yeah, it's uh, a little bit scary, and we're probably almost mated, but I think we can probably bail out into something like this and mm. maybe survive. I, I don't know, this looks pretty bad. I'm sure this is pretty much over yeah and everything's going to drop uh fair enough maybe but not as good as i thought i still think this is the best practical approach because the alternative was not very good either and white really cleaned up without any much trouble from here that's a good point sometimes even if it's not objectively good you have to try it because it results in a win mm -hmm. if if white's shoulders slump and he decides he's blown it you win the game yeah and uh let's just show one more nice trick that rufus found he found bishop takes g7 and the idea is that he now gets to lift the rook with tempo and this is a crushing mating attack on the seventh rank and black must give the entire queen away and now we're making a new queen in short order ouch nothing more to say nope but well played by rufus mm -hmm. carrying forward this was an interesting game i think Somewhat chaotically played out of the opening. Uh, we are, got to a position that I think has pieces in different squares than normal, but is not is not in any way bad. Um, I think White has some good active possibilities here. White just played the very nice attacking move of B4. The idea is that both of these pawns are invulnerable because they both allow White to push C5 and pick up a piece. Yeah, that is a very nice move from Salal. Mm -hmm. I hope uh, I hope he's hearing this. <laughs> yeah, now one trick. Uh, we do have to be a little bit careful that we're not going to hang our queen to something like this. But even this, I think we're getting so much material um, that it's probably okay. And I think the ending position is going to be something depressing for, uh, for black. I think it's probably a piece to the good. Maybe we can make something happen on a7 after a move like uh, bishop f4. Right, right, absolute. <laughs> that one has to count. <laughs> Darn. Okay, but uh, it's it's unfortunate to note that although Salal is definitely using the right ideas here and, mm -hmm. and coming in with some attacks, that... Uh, <laughs> yes, that's it. Yes, a, a brand of spirits, perhaps. Um, that he does, I think, get scared at this next moment. And after mm -hmm. taking on c5 and being met with knight c5, 
because of this discovered attack idea that Andrew, you just mentioned of Bishop H2 check, he decided not to take the knight, but actually white may be winning after that position. Yes. And again, this is just a boatload of material for white for the queen. And I think here taking the rook is better than taking on B7 because we have two bishops and a rook for the queen. Yes, we have a lot of loose pawns, something like queen a2 is possible, starting to scoop up these pawns, but I don't think it's good to start taking these pawns in this particular case. White's going to be able to double the rooks very quickly on the b file. The knight here stops any sort of back rank mates, and b6 is not possible because of the c5 pawn. Absolutely. <laughs> Just went for it. Well when in done. doubt, embrace it. Yes, no, I did want to just mention, we have a, a rhyme that I'm a very, very big fan of, which is with a knight on f8, there is no mate. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it doesn't rhyme as well, but the knight on f1 plays exactly the same role. Yes. Uh, so here, instead, what we had happen was bishop takes b7. Unfortunately, that gives up a piece. It looks good, but it's, uh, it's not justifiable. And there's not quite enough. The c file and the d file are both closed because of these pawns and white is not able to mount an attack. If white had all the time in the world, probably we could double rooks, but black actually plays very quickly um, to finish his development, and white helps a little bit by making this trade over here. Again, we don't really wanna make trades unless we have a good reason to, and this just serves to bring another pawn into the center for black, and open the G file for some counterattacking ideas. Yeah, this is starting to look very, very scary. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so it looks good, but unfortunately, black has the extra piece, and materials usually worth it in chess. Yes, yes, and Nate, I think, did a reasonable job here of of um, coordinate. He has to do some consolidating. His king is very vulnerable, mm -hmm. but after that, I think it was, uh, as they say, all tortoise, no sign of the hare. Yeah, and the last thing that I wanted to talk about from this game. When you're down material, you want to keep the queens on and keep attacking chances. So here a move like queen a4 is a good idea. This actually stops uh, black from taking anything on c4 because of the pin. Uh, something like queen takes c4, we have the nice choice between taking on a5 or playing rook c1 pinning the queen. Unfortunately, white played queen b5 and black spent very little time before swapping off the queens. And this knight now, even though it gets pinned, it's fine. There's a there's enough material for black to be able to score a win from here. You know, I would say that that comes down to one of two problems, maybe both. Number one, uh, developing more psychological strength that when something disappointing happens, staying in it and still trying to win the game. I can certainly say, and so can Andrew, I've seen many of them, that many a swindle has happened when we mm -hmm. were both down and out. Um, but stayed and looked for the trick that would save us. And the second thing is, a lot of that comes from sheer practical tournament experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that Salal's here participating with us because this is only his second tournament. So he's getting a lot of good education. Going to a game that's relatively quick, but I think does demonstrate good tactical alertness. We had Matt Loving versus Andrew Larimer, which happened just this afternoon and was, I think, our final game to finish. Um, so I don't think there's too much to say about the opening. I think Matt, due to some nerves, misplayed the London mm. system and it got a little bit different mm -hmm. than he had planned. But right here, he shows excellent alertness. The knight is unfortunately on a very vulnerable square. And it is a good demonstration of that Russian chess school maxim that a piece that is attacked exactly as many times as, is, as it is defended is essentially just a loose piece. Yeah, if we can attack that knight one more time, it will be hanging. So we already have ideas of bishop b5 to attack the knight. Unfortunately, bishop b5 doesn't work because black can recapture with the knight and get the knight out of the way. Um, taking with the queen would just be a complicated trade, although this does give white some very good dark square control. I can't actually decide whether I want to take with the bishop or the queen. I love problems like this where you have too many good moves. <laughs> so black should do something about that. Black should probably play knight f5 and get the knight out of the way. And this also threatens to take off the dark square bishop, which is the bishop that I'm most worried about because black doesn't have a dark square bishop to oppose it. Ah, yeah, he's even threatening to win another pawn. I think black did, due to an inaccuracy on Matt's part, go up a pawn earlier in this mm -hmm. game. Yeah, so unfortunately black played bishop b7 here, which looks nice. It puts some pressure on the king side, but it does not address the issues in the position. And Matt very sharply saw this trick and he took the knight 
And after the queen took back, we have bishop b5 with a discovered check, and we're winning an entire queen. Yes, I think this uh, I think this was a bit devastating to Andrew. Mm -hmm. I think he was really looking forward to this, as he did very well in our previous tournament. And I think he still can. So yes. chin up. This is the kind of tactic that only happens to somebody once. There are a lot of rounds left, and this won't happen again. Yes. All right. Carrying I think the next forward. game is between Ted and Alex. So we had an interesting Roy Lopez type opening, and we got to this position. We see that white has closed the center by playing d5, but in exchange for that, black has this annoying pin and kind of has some good pressure um, on the light squares. White's bishop is over on c2, and it's really a long ways away from getting back into the fray. So this is a reason not to play d5 unless you have to um, in the Roy Lopez, just because it really does lock in this bishop forever. Uh, there's never a trick of uh, black taking and getting this e5 break for white. That seems like enough arrows. All right, so here, uh, black castled. It's a relatively normal looking uh, position for both sides. And now white played b4, which is a little bit interesting. It attacks the knight, and after knight c4, we can trade. And this pawn on c4 is very weak. But interestingly, there's no good way for white to take that pawn off without really giving up the king side. So if we play something like queen e2, and let's just say black passes, even if we take here, the entire king side is laid bare because the queen has abandoned her duties holding on to this f3 square. And this is very, very good for black already. Yes, that f5 seems to be coming there, mm -hmm. uh, even if it maybe temporarily sacks a pawn. I, I don't think I care. Yeah, I think uh, the dark squares are very nice as well. Uh, bishop f4 would be a relatively straightforward way to play. And I think there's probably going to be too many mating ideas or opportunities for black to trade off the queens under very favorable circumstances when both of the rooks get active on the queen side. I'd like to look at this b4 move in yet another way, just briefly, mm -hmm. which is also that this move b4, which certainly weakens some squares, and you have to recognize that... Um, I think that's something that we're certainly going to be reinforcing over the next few weeks. So, Ted, if you haven't heard it before, hear it now. But the other thing I want to think about is this knight is poorly placed on a5. Mm -hmm. The knight is not in a good place. And so to help him or to play a move which essentially only encourages him to come to a better square on c4 it seems not in white's interest. Yeah, I think uh, there are many lines where black would play knight c4 on his own anyways. Uh, it does start to put some pressure on um, these knights. Uh, I'm drawing the wrong line there, but there we go. Uh, because we're threatening to take on d2, and if the queen recaptures, f3 would drop. So knight c4 is actually a good move for black anyways. So forcing black to play a good move is not always something we want to do. In fact, is it outrageous to suggest b3? No, I actually like b3 an awful lot just to try and control the square uh, c4. Very good. Yeah, so a missed opportunity there, Ted. Something to mm -hmm. look for for next game. Yeah. Anything else you wanted to say in that No, that, that's mostly what I noticed. <laughs> okay. Um, there were a couple other moments that were interesting. I think uh, Black kind of gets to a position where he's not up material, but I already think Black's much better, and he's probably pressing for the win here. Um, I didn't like a5. I think this resolves the tension on the queen side too readily. Uh, it lets Black trade on d5, and now Black's plan is simply to play f5 and try and do something useful in the center with e4 and f4. Yeah, it's possible that Ted thought that the opening of the light squared bishop was going to do a lot for him, mm -hmm. but uh, Alex Host shows very good alertness here and immediately plays bishop g6 and mm -hmm. just kills that idea. Yeah, and now f5 is ready to go. Uh, I don't think there's any reason to wait on it. Uh, something like knight h4, which looks good optically, unfortunately hangs the whole night, so we don't have to worry about something like that. Ouch. Mm-hmm. Oh, Nate Humphrey spotted in the chat. Sorry, buddy. You snooze, you lose. You'll have to catch it on the VOD. <laughs> we did cover your game. We thought you did a good job. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think it's time to get to our feature game. Fabulous. Yes, so this was a late addition to the standings. Uh, we had Danny Boston D5 Finn coming in to the lists uh, to play against Frank Jakes, a newcomer to our tournament whom we're very glad to have. And I wanted to give this game a little bit of time just because I thought it was a really excellent example of white holding serve. Uh, Danny's mm -hmm. been playing, I think, quite a bit. I mean, probably more than anybody else that's playing in the tournament. I've seen him online, mm -hmm. uh, particularly late at night. And he seems to have picked up a couple of useful attacking ideas. Um, so we have a standard London system mm -hmm. opening. 
Um, I think Black's moves are reasonable so far. Mm -hmm. Certainly putting the bishop on d6. Usually c5 instead of knight c6 is a little bit better, but mm. knight c6 is not the end of the world by any stretch. Yes, yes, that's true. And then this is, going back to an earlier point mm -hmm. from the broadcast, an opportunity where I think Frank has to lay off from trading. Although this dark squared bishop is useful for white, certainly we've talked about the dark squared mm -hmm. bishop quite a bit this evening, trading allows white to open the h file and get some activity very early in the game with his h1 rook and now quite rightly if i'm playing white i wouldn't even castle and in fact danny doesn't he decides to just leave the rook where it is and hope for good things to happen yeah and now that the dark square bishops have been traded i would even consider a move like g6 just to try and blunt this bishop i think it's a big problem uh to deal with the h file i might have to play h5 to reinforce the structure that way it's already a little bit tenuous um, for black to try and come up with moves that will hold it together yeah i think i think probably it's not a terrible idea here to play something like bishop d7 and queen e7 mm -hmm. and actually try to scoot the king over over to the queen side but even with the king on the correct side of the board for this position i would say the queen side of, the king side attack excuse me is still going to be dangerous it definitely i think we're probably going to end up losing the h pawn at some point so it's are we getting enough compensation and development uh so that if white spends all the time trying to go scoop that up we're getting something in return for it now, this is one moment where the knight on c6 is favorable. Once we castle queenside, we're happier with the pawn back on c7 than on c5. Yes. So this would have been a way to try and tie everything together and uh, hold the position and make it look like a normal chess position, so to speak. Yes, I think uh, going... I know that Frank, I think, has taken a long time off from playing mm -hmm. before re-entering with us, although he has been uh, taking part in our classes. But uh, this is a practical skill sense of danger. Castling into this as he does in just another few moves is really asking for trouble as the rest of the game demonstrates. Yeah, and already uh, we see that the light squares are really, really tough to deal with. Uh, we would like to play e5 and try and open up our light square bishop for the defense. Unfortunately, there's no good way to do that. If we try to play something like knight d7 and e5, we probably are already running into white playing e4 and blowing up the center under favorable circumstances. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, it seems like uh, black is a day late and a dollar short. Yes. And now we see an interesting idea of G4. I think black probably has to take and uh, try and hold on for dear life here. Allowing this pawn to come to G5 is really way too much. And this uh, pawn on H6 serves as a hook for white's attack. White will push a pawn to, H, uh, to G5 and open either the H or the G file with that pawn. Yeah, I think uh, after this, Danny puts on a bit of a clinic in terms mm -hmm. of how to conduct a kingside attack. Yeah, so Black definitely does the right thing. He opens up the center. He has to do something in the center when he's being attacked on the wing. Unfortunately, pawn takes e5. We're getting that crucial tempo on the knight, and now we get to play g5. And already, I think uh, Black has a hard time finding a move. I think maybe we have to take on d3 just to try and solve the light squares yes the combination of the incredible difficulties of the h file which this bishop best coordinates with the attack on and i think a typical rule of thumb that the light squared bishop is one of white's most mm -hmm. dangerous attacking minor pieces in opening after opening after opening and so this is another note i wanted to make sure we made in terms of making trades for good reasons if i have to make the choice i'm definitely getting that bishop off the board every time yep and I agree, uh, especially because our king's weak. Yes. Um, taking on f3 is almost certainly the wrong um, minor piece to take. We're leaving this battery intact. It's a very scary battery to deal with. And furthermore, uh, we open up the g file as well. So now moves like king e2 uh, are actually possible to try and bring this other rook into the game. Yeah, it's very clear. I mean, a, a good maybe litmus test for this position is just it's very clear what almost every white piece is going to do mm -hmm. in the next few turns, with the possible exception of that B1 knight. <laughs> He's got maybe, I guess he'll find his way to the F3 square, but uh, and it's not anywhere near so clear what black is going to do. Yeah, this is where we really wish we were playing a knight odds game like Morphe, and if we just take that knight off the board when our opponent's not looking, we get to play rook G1 that much faster. It's true. Yeah, you actually could stand to give away a piece and mm -hmm. then attack with even more more gusto Ooh, that's tough to even mm, i feel sorry uh but uh, moving forward and seeing just the end of the attack mm -hmm. as it was conducted very well 
Um, Danny rips open the G file, takes with the rook quite wisely. I think there are already checkmate possibilities threatened. Maybe yeah, it's... this is a, a very serious threat already. Something like bishop h7 and bishop g8 trying to give that away um, so that the queen can come in and have an open line. Yeah, yet another case of giving minor pieces away just to get the big guys into play. This one's a little bit more justified than sneaking the b1 knight off the board. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right, so after king f8, uh, I'm not a fan of king f8. I think it's premature to try and run with the king. I think it's more important to try and develop a piece. Uh, knight e5 would be the best defensive try here um, by far. We're covering some light squares, which is important. We're ready to develop our bishop. And we don't have to deal with any threats yet because the queen is in the wrong place. If the queen and the bishop's positions were reversed, we would be mated at once, um, probably starting with... Um, Rook h8, but also queen h7 it. would work. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of a the last ditch for black to just try and get the knight active. Again, an attack on the side must be met by a counterattack in the middle. Yes, yes. Getting rid of that light squared bishop at all costs. Mm -hmm. uh, right, and so instead, Frank tried to make a run for it with king to f8, but as much as this does secure the king a little bit, it also gives white that much more time to coordinate his attack. Yeah, and now we see that that knight, we had to spend a tempo to get it out of the way. Uh, queen f6 is good. It develops the queen to a good square. And here, once again, I think king e2 is a real idea, and it would let us bring this rook over to the g or h file right away. And notable, because it finds employment for the d2 knight, making sure that the ugly queen takes f3 is not possible, which that is would true. definitely have spoiled white's fun. A little bit. <laughs> and we don't have to worry about anything like this uh, with the pin, because we have... C takes D4. Yes, yeah. So All everything right. is holding together. It is. F4 is also a good move. And after knight G6, we already see that ideas of bishop takes G6 with an overwhelming position and a couple of extra pawns in an endgame are going to be possible. Uh, white castled. White is not as much of a daredevil as I am. He wants his king over safely on the queen side instead of dancing on E2. And now I don't like knight H4. I think it just lets the end appear that much more quickly because everything comes with tempo now yes yes yeah, so rook h1 picking up a tempo on the knight the knight goes back we lift the rook with a devastating pin and we're already threatening things like taking on f7 um, and now after king e7 that walks into a fatal pin of the f pawn so that allows us to take on g6 really Here, I, I might have taken with the rook but taking with the bishop is equally fine as well Yes, yes. I think Danny shows a little bit of natural conservatism. Mm -hmm. He knows, he. I imagine he knew he had the game in hand and a very safe attack and was thinking, just don't blunder. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Blundering is when you're up material, you want to go very slowly. He still has 38 minutes. Take your time. Make sure you're making the strongest moves possible and really try and uh, maximize your advantage and make sure that you're getting all of the... Uh, everything that the position has to offer. Yes, I have to say, I think as players gain more and more experience, that some of this will naturally happen. Mm -hmm. But something we did see week after week in our last tournament, and I would love to see players start to work to amend, is players not using all of their time. And I think here, especially, there were a lot of very hasty captures and trades made without any thought as to the implications. Now, Sometimes with newer players, they say, well, I'm not sure that I would have known any better what to do if I'd spent a little more time. And I think that's a perfectly fair objection. But hopefully through watching these roundups and other resources mm. that we're more than happy to share, you will start to understand the very significant effect that all of these moves have on the position. Yeah. So in this case, I think Black does find some good defensive ideas. Unfortunately, he's already down a decisive amount of material and all of the white pieces are swarming. Rook f8 is good to hold on to the pawn temporarily. Uh, white attacks this pawn instead. Here, maybe c6 to try and hold on to it, but I think we're already um, running into problems with queen a3 and something on the dark squares. Um, but again, just a defensive idea. Uh, Bishop f5 doesn't really uh, address the problems in the position. And now we're able to trade queens and pick off yet another piece. And two pieces up is enough. And black actually resigned after knight f3, not hanging anything on the back rank. Yes. And, you know, I have to say, I'm, not, I'm singing Danny's praises tonight. But um, this is another good example of something that strong chess players 
are flexible with their win condition. And mm -hmm. he was not so insistent on playing for checkmate that he was afraid to simply trade the pieces off and be up. Yep, and trading queens let him win the uh, bishop on f5, so it is a good reason to trade pieces, especially when you're already at material. Yes, absolutely. Mm. <laughs> well, of course that's how we should end the show. Um, I wanted to maybe just point out one other thing just to get a public announcement mm -hmm. out there about the tournament. So we did have an 11th game on the schedule, which unfortunately, I won't go into the details here, I find that completely unnecessary, but due to a miscommunication in scheduling emails, was unable to be played. So I have dealt with that situation by awarding some buys to both players and uh, trying to sort of make do as best as mm -hmm. I could. All I want to say here is please be sure that you are being very clear with the other players, many of whom you are meeting for the first time. And actually not everyone here is even uh, a primary English speaker. So um, just make sure that you are being really clear in your language and that you're both on the same page so that we don't have a situation where we get to the end of the week and suddenly all the days are exhausted and we still haven't played. Yes, and I think the tournament's still wide open, so we just pulled up the standing so that everybody can see what's going on. We have five more games. It should be a really fun time, and hopefully we all learn something from the games as we go through them. Yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it, especially round two is always very mm -hmm. exciting because it's the first time, okay, you've got two players who have each won one game. Now you've got to deal with somebody who's hot, right? And that temperature will only increase uh, until we get around the midpoint. So I'm looking forward to it, and thank you all for coming in and watching and for participating in this wonderful adventure. And once again, I am your host, John Harden, for National Master Andrew Hoy. Thank you for watching. Acceptable Chess.